For this year's primary election, registered voters need to watch for their ballots arriving by mail in late July. Following the instructions, seal your ballot in the envelope provided and be sure to sign the back. Envelopes without your signature will not be accepted. Look for your free elections guide in the newspaper or at these locations statewide. There are no polling places. So be sure to mail your ballot at least five days prior to election day. Hawaii Hawaii votes by by mail. Well, aloha to everyone tuning in here. I'm Ryan Kalei joined by Yanji T- Denise. It is July 20th, a Monday. Great to start this week with all of you once again here on Spotlight Hawaii. We, will, of course, want to thank our sponsors that we just saw there, the Office of Elections, as we continue in our conversation with the candidates for Honolulu Mayor. Yeah, that's right. And this morning we are joined by Keith Amamiya. We are so happy to have him on today. Uh, he is a fresh face to politics, but certainly no stranger in our community. He served in Oahu as a business executive, a nonprofit leader, and also a lawyer for the last 30 years. He's very well known, of course, for his work as the executive director of the Hawaii High School Athletics Association. In 2009, back when state budget cuts threatened public high school junior varsity sports, he spearheaded the Save Our Sports campaign that successfully kept athletic programs afloat. Now he is running for political office for the first time, to serve as mayor of Honolulu. So we are so ha- happy this morning to welcome Keith Amamiya. And that right. of course was a headshot and here he is live in person. Thank you so much for being here with us on this Monday morning. Uh, let's start out with the basics. Why do you wanna have this job? Well, first of all, thanks for having me And I'm running for mayor because we need change. We need new leadership. We need a fresh perspective and we need to restore trust in government. Uh, I've been on the campaign trail for about 11 months now, and people tell me two things in particular. Number one, they want change. They're tired of the status quo. They want a new, different, inclusive style of leadership. And then secondly, they want, um, or they're concerned about the high cost of living, including the high costs of housing. Uh, I want to change that. It's becoming very difficult for many, many families to make ends meet. COVID-19 has made it even worse. And it's causing a lot of families, especially our younger families, uh, to consider or actually move to the mainland. Uh, And it's also discouraging younger families from coming back here uh, to live, work, play, and raise their families. And and I want to change that. Um, As you pointed out, my roots Uh, are in many different areas of executive leadership. But during my time at the Hawaii High School Athletic Association, that formed the basis for really why I'm running for mayor. I had a chance to go across the state and meet many different people in all communities across the state and especially on Oahu. And I learned firsthand their struggles to make ends meet. And so That, in a nutshell, is why I'm running for mayor. I want to make a difference. I want to fight for the working class people and the underdogs without a voice. You know, of course, one of the things that we like to do is we like to involve the audience. So for those people who are watching in, we encourage you to ask your questions. This is your opportunity to speak directly to the candidates. Some of the questions that we already have coming in, Katie's saying, uh, we have a lot of reasons not to trust government right now. Uh, And Nalei asks, what will you do to change the shadow of corruption over our city government and elective officials. We know that there, of course, has been uh, the longstanding trial with the Kealohas. Uh, There are some other investigations that go on in other departments. Uh, What would you do to sort of bring a little bit more transparency to the office? And how would you sort of break this perception of distrust amongst government and city leaders? Well, first, uh, there's a lot of mistrust because there's not uh, or can be much better communication between government and the general public. And that's why I've mentioned in my talks across the island that one of the things I want to do when I'm first elected mayor is to create an office of community engagement. That office, their sole job will be to go out in the community, get meaningful dialogue, meaningful feedback, um, and, and hear the people's voice before any decisions are made. Too often the public feels that they're the last to know about a project in their neighborhood and that upsets them and and rightfully so. If we reach out to them earlier and get feedback from them, I think we'll have a lot less problems when it comes to certain projects and proposals from the city and we'll have a lot lot, uh, less opposition. And in fact, we'll have proposals that that are win-win situations, which is 
what I always try to do. In terms of restoring trust, uh, you need to lead by example, and it starts from the top. And uh, my career has been marked by, you know, leading with integrity, leading with trust, being inclusive, and I'll continue that as mayor. I will surround myself with a strong team with shared values, and we will make sure that no corruption exists in city government and take a zero tolerance approach. You know, one of the things you talked about in your opening was the struggle for working class families. People are feeling that now more than ever with COVID. What do you think of the governor delaying the opening of Trans-Pacific travel to the 1st of September or perhaps beyond? I know that this is a state decision, decision, not necessarily a city one, but of course the two go hand in hand. What do you think about when we can safely reopen to tourism? Well, I'm presuming the governor has relied on the advice in part of healthcare professionals or medical professionals on, on when to reopen. First and foremost, the safety of our communities are paramount, uh, the safety of our frontline workers, whether they're in the healthcare field or the visitor industry or retail stores or grocery stores. We need to make sure that they're safe before we, we reopen our economy. Now, having said that, we need to reopen our economy, especially tourism. Too many people rely on tourism for their paychecks, whether it's indirectly or directly. Uh, what I do hope that the state is doing is that whenever we reopen, we're ready, that the policies are in place, the guidelines are in place. I sense that some People or a lot of people are still unsure exactly what you can do when it reopens and how you can get um, cleared and avoid the 14 day quarantine. Uh, I've been told that it's not so easy to get a COVID test at CVS, which is what I've heard. You know, you can go to any CVS on the mainland within 72 hours. And if you're cleared, then you can avoid the 14 day quarantine. But uh, I've been told it's not necessarily that easy to, to get a test. So we need to clarify all those things and, and make it as streamlined and clear cut as possible so that people uh, who wanna come here will come here and won't be discouraged by the lack of information or the lack of clarity. You know, one of the co course things that has happened because of COVID-19 obviously is it's gonna have an impact on the overall city operating budget. Uh, the amount of tax dollars that's going to be brought in to help manage just city services and dis hard decisions are going to be have to be made. Uh, you know, you spoke earlier about adding another department potentially to city government uh, to help with the transparency issue. But how are you going to add programs and continue to provide services with this downfall? And, and if you have to make cuts, what sort of decisions do you think and where would those cuts come from? So for now, uh, you know, the city finances are... Uh, in pretty good shape despite this economic crisis we're in. A couple of things. First, there was a, a healthy cash balance carryover from the last fiscal year to the current fiscal year uh, that's helped uh, stem uh, any anticipated losses. Secondly, the real property tax assessments and the real property tax revenue uh, is still uh, quite strong. We'll have to wait and see when the next assessment is due whether that uh, will be impacted by COVID-19. And then third, uh, the federal government has already given the, the city millions and millions of dollars in stimulus money. And there's a chance, a good chance, that there will be a lot more uh, money coming from the federal government to help our city government ensure that its services are still provided. So for now, I think we're okay. And with respect to the Office of Community Engagement, it's not an entire new department. It's, it's gonna be, a an office uh, that's affixed to one of the departments. And so the cost to the city shouldn't be that much. Let's get to Daniel Alvarez's question. He wants to know about your stance on rail. Will you uh, support stopping at Middle Street or support finishing it to Ala Moana? And bottom line, how do we pay for it? So like Daniel and everyone else out there, I've been, I've been very frustrated with rail, if not upset at times uh, from the pre-planning stages up to the current status of the project. Uh, but having said that, we need to do what we can to finish rail. Um, it, it, it's an important means of transportation. It's an important alternative to cars, uh, getting people off the road. It'll help our environment. Uh, and also we can't afford to have to give back the $800 million we've already received in federal subsidies for the rail, rail project if we don't complete rail 
all the way to Ala Moana. Rail is also an important <clears throat> economic driver. It'll, it'll stimulate construction and development of many things, including housing uh, via the transit-oriented development that will be built along the rail lines and especially at the rail stations that we have. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, a supporter of rail being completed to Ala Moana, but of course we need to keep a close watch on the project from here on out and, and make sure that the overruns and other problems that have existed uh, beforehand no longer take place. You know, when you look at rail as a whole, it's going to take some time for it to become sort of operational where that reality of people who live out all the way in these rural communities are able to get to places like Ala Moana and, and it will take some time. Uh, what could you what would you suggest uh, or what would you like to do to help alleviate some of those traffic concerns more in the immediacy? Uh, what do you think could be done to help improve the quality of life and the traffic situation that continues to uh, get bad. I know right now it's not as bad because COVID-19 and a lot of people are working from home, but in a normal situation, uh, you know, people are still suffering through traffic. You know, there's a lot of ways. Uh, there's a combination of things that can be done. And as you as you pointed out, Ryan, COVID-19 has shown us that, you know, um, traffic can actually be pretty good um, and it doesn't always have to be bad. Uh, we can look at four day work weeks. We can look at staggered work hours. Uh, we can look at more work at home or stay at home options. Um, in fact, I think a lot of private employers uh, were forced to allow work from home and, and both the employer and employee kind of like it. So that alone will alleviate a lot of the traffic concerns that we have. Uh, we should also do, uh, besides complete rail, uh, continue the complete streets projects that the city is undertaking that requires or will uh, uh, will result in more pedestrian walkways, more safer ways to walk, more bike lanes and bike paths. So uh, there's a lot of ways to reduce traffic and I'm confident that rail and the other things I mentioned will help us uh, solve that issue. Let's get to James Minihan's question, which is kind of a broad, a bigger picture question. What sets you apart from the other candidates? And what advice would you give to furloughed families who aren't going to be able to pay August rent? Um, you know, let's take those as two different questions. So first off, what sets you apart? And then the second, what advice do you give for people who are struggling so hard right now? Well, I'm a first time candidate, so I'll bring a new perspective. I'll bring the much needed change we need in government. Uh, but having said that, I have a broad based uh, uh, set of experiences uh, on the executive level in the public, private, nonprofit sectors. I'm also a lawyer by trade uh, in many of my jobs, including running the Hawaii High School Athletic Association. That was a statewide organization that required you to work with all levels of government. Uh, the public school system, uh, the communities, and even unions. Uh, no other candidate has that broad cross set of experiences. And so uh, I think that all combined will serve me well. I've also been able to serve on the Honolulu Police Commission, the Hawaii State Board of Education, and the Aloha Stadium Authority. So uh, I have experience in government, but yet I haven't been in government or in politics, and I view that as a plus. And, and to his other question, you know, one of the things that the city has been doing now is trying to make more CARES Act funding directly available to people doing things like rental assistance. I know there's some um, services now that are uh, helping to cover child care costs. Would you extend that? What, what, do you, what advice, you know, James asked, what advice would you give to furloughed families who aren't going to be able to pay August rent? Well, I would redouble the city and state's efforts. Uh, you know, obviously, I don't, I wouldn't control the state, but we need to combine our resources, be efficient, and and increase the services and resources and funding we provide to these families uh, when they need it the most. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the city has been uh, the beneficiary, if you will, of tens of millions of dollars, uh, if not more, in CARES relief money that's supposed to go straight to families and straight to small businesses. Those are two groups that are hurting the most right now. And as mayor, I'll make sure that they get it. Um, I also think it's important for the city to work with the nonprofit community uh, in terms of getting the services and money to the neediest. Uh, the not many nonprofits 
are better equipped there. They work more directly with communities than the city. And so I know the city's already doing that, but I would continue to do that and in fact, increase the collaboration with nonprofit providers throughout our island. Of course, another uh, issue that many candidates have been talking about and many residents are concerned about is just the issue of homelessness and the number that is could potentially rise with those families who are struggling with COVID-19, uh, many who could potentially see themselves back on the streets. Well, what is sort of your plan for tackling homelessness during this time with uh, potential for this to sort of be uh, expanded because of the impact of COVID-19? Well, there's several things that should be done. The first is uh, I've, I've been the first and only candidate with a comprehensive housing for all plan that seeks to address the massive 22,000 unit shortage we have in terms of housing here on the island. Um, the lack of housing is a big reason that there's a homelessness problem or houselessness problem. Uh, too many families or individuals can't afford the rent uh, to that's, that's required or, or um, being asked of them uh, in this in this uh, uh, economy right now, and so we need to build more housing. Um, you know, it's it's a difficult but rather straightforward solution. Secondly, we need to provide more mental health treatment services and substance abuse treatment services. Those services have been reduced dramatically over the last ten to twenty years for various reasons, and it's never been increased. It's clear we need more of those services because a lot of the people we see on the streets are, are definitely in, in need of help be, besides money. They, they have issues that, that can't be taken care of by money alone. They need specialized treatment. And as mayor, I'll make sure they get that treatment. You know, there was a big article in the paper yesterday about some negative campaign um, mailers that have been going out about you specifically. Um, we want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. Uh, it's not something we're used to seeing that much here in local politics, but uh, there, the, the campaign definitely has taken an ugly turn when you look at that. Um, can you give us your take on those mailers and the allegations that lie within? Well, actually, um, it, it's been around even locally, maybe not as prevalent or widespread uh, on the mainland uh, and in national races, but it, it's unfortunate. It's been it's been around for a while, even here. And uh, in terms of the allegations against me, they're they're simply untrue. Um, it's unfortunate that this type of uh, activity has has risen or arisen in in the mayor's race, but. Um, it is what it is. Um, you know, I, I, I obviously don't condone those actions. My campaign certainly doesn't condone those actions. And we just move forward. We, we have a positive campaign. Uh, we're going to keep it positive. We're going to keep to uh, getting our message across the island. And, um, you know, we, we're confident uh, in our mission and in our message and that it'll, re it'll resonate with the voters. You know, of course, that Miller sort of dealt with uh, a high rise condominium in Kaka'ako, but there is concern by some who live in the urban core that there is just too much development in the area. We are seeing uh, a number of proposed high rises now in the Ala Moana area with more uh, condominiums coming up there. And some people just feel that it is changing the landscape, obviously, and the look of the city. H how would you manage that? You're calling for more housing, uh, but trying to really balance the growth of the island and some of these high rises that seemingly are taking over the skyline of Honolulu. Well, it's a delicate balance because, you know, we need more housing and we are an island state. And so we only have so much open space. So we have to find places where they're, they best fit. And so uh, in terms of addressing the housing shortage, we, uh, the urban core is a natural place to look, especially along the rail line. It's already developed. Uh, but we need a mixture of both high-rise uh, condominiums and also uh, low-rise or medium-sized apartment buildings um, uh, spread throughout the urban core. So again, you can't please everyone, but people need housing. And you know, we, we need to take care of each other like we always do in Hawaii, and we have to make sacrifices. And if it requires more housing to be built in the urban core, uh, we, we simply need to do that. We can't let uh, people go without a house or struggle too much to pay uh, rent or, or uh, a lease uh, or even their mortgage payment. So um, that's my position uh, that we still need to look at it. Now, 
Um, there is an argument, a fair one, that uh, maybe we have too much luxury development uh, and let's pivot to making building homes or housing for working class Oahu residents. And I'm all for that. Um, if I have to pick between a luxury development or, a, or housing that's for uh, our fellow Oahu residents, I'll pick Oahu residents time and time again. Uh, on that same subject, let's put in Denise's question, Ryan. It was a little bit farther back, but I think it, it pertains to this topic. And uh, Denise is asking, what will you do to help rural Oahu stay rural and retain open space? You know, with the rail, you talked about transit-oriented development. That, of course, is the development in the urban core, what uh, Ryan is talking about. But what mm -hmm. do you, how do you feel about some of these developments that are happening um, further out? So the ones that are happening further out, they're already underway, they've already been uh, approved, but I'm not in favor of further development uh, outside of the urban core. Uh, and uh, if any proposal comes up, uh, I will look very closely at it, but I'm focused on uh, <clears throat> building in the urban core. I'm not in favor of more development outside of the urban core. And in fact, about a week ago, I, I spoke to the North Shore Community Association and I told them the same thing, that I'm not in favor of more development out uh, on that part of the island. Um, we should keep the country country, uh, so to speak. And I, I fully support uh, that that phrase and that notion. Let's get to fast kind, unless Ryan, you have something else, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I just uh, had one more question before we got there. And, and, th and that's really, again, on the same thread of, of development and, and other projects that are happening. You know, we've seen a lot of opposition now from the community as they've spoken out against, of course, the uh, Sherwood project out uh, in Waimanalo. Of course, the there was the playground at the, uh, you know, at Alamoana Beach Park and, and including those wind uh, turbines out on the North Shore. How do you manage sort of uh, really the infrastructure of Oahu, the needs of the community, uh, and balancing this no, uh, voice of opposition by those who feel that it is impacting uh, their community. Well, again, I go back to my earlier concern that that somehow, some way, people have lost trust trust in government. Government seems to have lost its way in terms of communicating with the public. Um, I I'll do as mayor what I've always done in my career to. Uh, get all the stakeholders to the table, have meaningful dialogue and dis uh, discussion and and tackle the problems and issues head on before you announce any project or proposal. That seems to have not been done enough in the past. And as mayor, I'll make sure I change that, that I will give the communities who are affected a voice and a meaningful role in the decision making process. Okay, let's get to the fun stuff. This is a segment we call Fast Kind, and this is kind of a get to know you sort of segment. So, um, you know, quick answers, one sentence or less. Tell us something people would find surprising about you. What's a hidden talent that you have? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's a hidden talent, but I'm, obs I'm obsessively neat. It drives everyone uh, around me crazy. Um, I, try to be very organized but i guess it's to a fault and people like to move things on my desk to see if i notice and and actually i do um, it's <laughs> sickness. Uh, i'm sorry but uh so i don't know if that's a talent but uh, uh well that, think... that reveals character all right ryan what's the yeah. next one all right if there were a movie based on your life what actor would you choose to play you oh my goodness ah uh, uh, Denzel Washington. I don't oh, know. Okay. Oh, nice. That's a good I, leading I man, an him. Oscar winner. I like it. Yeah. That's a good choice. Okay. Well, the obvious one is Daniel Day Kim. <laughs> 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 I, I would go with Denzel. You know, we look nothing alike. But. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, what's the kindest thing that someone's ever done for you? Uh, oh, that's that's an easy one. Uh, my best friend's family when I was in high school, when I had some challenges with my family uh, in my family life, uh, they brought me in and, and hanaid me or adopted me and took me in as one of their own. And so I, 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 I was grateful in a time of need and they, they raised me like one of their own. They had four other children, three boys and a girl, and they took a fifth person like me in and um, again, I learned a lot about 
um, values and giving back and kindness and appreciation, discipline, hard work ethic, et cetera. So I'm, I'm forever grateful to the Kobayashi family. What was the last show or series that you binge watched? Or have you binge watched anything? Oh my goodness, this is so embarrassing. Um, Tiger King. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hard to resist. I, sad to say, I we binge watched that. That that's one bizarre show, but you can't stop watching it. <laughs> um, I know, but I didn't see it yet. So I'm gonna give you a few categories of this because you are so uh, you know well versed in sports. What's your favorite sports team locally, and what's your favorite sports team nationally? Well, locally, heck, I mean, they're, they're, in terms of college, of course, the University of Hawaii, you know, they're my favorite team. Uh, they're, they're the one and only Division One program, and they represent our state. So they're my favorite. Um, in terms of sports teams, I have, a, you know, we don't have one on in Hawaii. So I'm going to go with um, our guy, Marcus Mariota, Las Vegas Raiders. They're my favorite team now because Marcus went there to be there. Hopefully they're starting quarterback. If and when they have an NFL season this yeah. this this fall, what candidate running for mayor other than yourself do you admire and respect the most? I will say uh, I admire I admired Frank Fossey, uh, former mayor who served many terms uh, in office. Uh, we're very now your your, <laughs> your fellow candidates who are running against you. If that's a question. Um. I respect them all. I admire them all. And um, what's your question? Like who I respect and admire? The most out of the other candidates running. You know, again, I respect them all. But I would say, I would say Kim Pine. You know, she's a fighter. She's, you know, she's female. And, you know, they have, you know, arguably greater challenges. Uh than 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 us guys, Ryan. Um, and so you know, she's 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 tenacious and she's a fighter. She represents the West Side, and so I admire those qualities in her. Okay, what's your favorite late night dining spot pre COVID? Where did you like to grab a bite to eat after you know going out and hanging out with the family? Uh, Zippies. Yeah, it seems to be a popular no, app. They, they got <laughs> a wide range of ra array of food that I like, from salmon to chili to everything in between. Yeah, popular answer amongst many candidates. All right, we uh, our time is wrapping up here, but we want to allow you a final moment to just say any other final thoughts that you may have for those who are watching and uh, considering who to vote for in this upcoming election. So, um, well, you know, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's been a privilege and an honor really to be able to run for the mayor of city and county of Honolulu. Um, this is a pivotal election for, for everyone, as we all know, and the voters have a choice. They can choose between the status quo or they can choose change. They can choose looking backwards and talking about the past or looking forward and envisioning a better, brighter Oahu. I'm choosing change and looking forward and I humbly ask the voters of Honolulu to join me in the journey to bring the much needed change to Oahu to make it the best that it can be for many, many years to come. Okay, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Keith Amamiya, candidate for Honolulu mayor. All right. Hello. Thanks for the opportunity. See you guys. Thank Hello. you. Well, good to hear from him. I like that answer. Denzel was unexpected. Yeah. I did it. I, I was thinking, who would that Daniel Day Kim? That's who he's going to say. But Denzel, I like that surprise answer. Uh, on a more serious note, I, you know, we know that he supports completing the rail all the way to Ala Moana Center. That's something that he had said before. Um, and interesting to hear his priorities when it comes to development, um, saying that, you know, we absolutely need more housing, um, but that he really wants to focus that housing on the urban core and affordable housing as opposed to luxury high rises, the kind that we usually see uh, in Kaka'ako and elsewhere. Yeah, and really mapped out his stance on sort of uh, tackling the homelessness issue uh, here. Of course, we interviewed now, what, four candidates? Five, Five. candidates. <laughs> candidate. uh, and hearing differences of opinions on that matter. And of course, it is something that uh, a lot of people obviously are concerned about. People here who uh, drive by the areas where we see more and more of these homeless camps that are popping up and, and how to tackle that will continue to be an issue for a while. So hearing 
sort of everybody's stance on that has been an interesting note to find and figure out where people stand, uh, these candidates stand on these various issues. Yeah, and also interesting to hear um, about what he plans to do with the city budget um, and saying basically that there, there are not going to be a lot of cuts to start, if at all possible. You know, some other candidates have uh, reflected more of tightening the purse strings, um, but he said that he would redouble the efforts when it comes to getting people aid um, and really not cutting services, at least to start. So, you know, that's a different sort of fiscal philosophy. And so it's interesting to hear the differences there as well. Yeah, and again, we encourage all those of you who are tuning in, uh, some of you who may have missed the entire sort of conversation that we had with Keith, Keith Amamiya to go back and watch it uh, in our replay on the platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. You can either watch it online on the website or also on Facebook. We also have the previous interviews, the other four candidates that we did interview. Uh, you can go back and watch. It's a great opportunity, I think, to sort of see where each of them stand on some of these issues. Uh, there, of course, are a lot of candidates, and this election cycle is unlike any other. Uh, there's very it have been very few opportunities where these candidates have had a chance to debate or to share their platforms and so our hopes is that this will spotlight some of the issues that uh, are concerning for those of you here on the island and allow you the chance to go back and compare some of their answers so encourage you also to go back if you have missed any of these interviews and we're not done yet we have one more coming up on wednesday that's right. We have Kim Pine joining us on Wednesday. She rounds out the candidate series. We'll have talked to six all together, and we do encourage you, as Ryan said, to go back and watch them all. We know that some folks have started to get their ballots already. Um, of course, Hawaii votes by mail, as we reminded you at the top. Next week, so Scott Nago from the Office of Elections is going to be joining us. Um, remember that if you have any issues with this, if you haven't gotten a ballot just yet, don't worry. Uh, they are coming out in batches, so not everyone has gotten theirs yet, but you can visit, visit elections.hawaii.gov or call that number there on your screen, 453-VOTE. If for some reason you miss the registration deadline, do not worry. You can register and vote same day from the 27th of July through August 7th, and then on election day itself, which is, of course, August 8th. You can do that at Honolulu Hale or Kapolei Hale. We're, as we said, we're going to have Scott Nago on to talk about all of this in detail, but we want you to take all this information and actually use it and cast your ballot, have your voice heard. Yeah, again, first time that Hawaii is sort of implementing this process. Those who voted absentee are somewhat familiar with it already. Uh, many people are used to the ballot and the way that it is structured, but many who are used to the traditional style are experiencing some questions that they have. So this is, again, another opportunity. If you are looking at your ballot and you have some questions, uh, a chance to sort of confirm the process uh, as we go through this for the first time all together as a community and really as a state, and also, we'll be catching up with Governor David Ige next week as well to sort of get an update on the status of Hawaii. We know that the state will be sort of has extended the 14 day quarantine for out of state visitors. And so we want to get an update from him. We would be speaking with him on Monday. So still a lot of content that uh, is coming forth. But again, looking forward to our next conversation with Kim Pine. That is on Wednesday. Yeah, and so until we see you then, please do wear a mask, physically distance, and stay safe out there. We can all do this, and we will see you right back here at 1030 on Wednesday with Kim Pine. Aloha. Aloha.